All right, brother. We're live now. How are you, man? It's good to see you. I'm I'm good, man. How are you doing? Good. I think we've been connected in a roundabout way for, I don't know, maybe six months or a year or something like that. But uh, I've really been inspired by what you do, especially as I got on my own uh, jujitsu path. So it's good to finally connect. Yeah. What got you into jujitsu? I'm curious. Uh, I had a friend of mine. I was in Southern Utah uh, bef- up until about a year ago, and uh, he had been training for roughly 10 years or so. And he'd been talking to me about it over and over again. And then we started running some events together for order of man for what we're doing. And Mm. we thought it'd be cool to sprinkle an element of jujitsu into it. So he said, yeah, come train. And so I got into it and then uh, moved up here to Maine, like I said, about a year ago uh, and got connected with the origin crew. So I trained with those guys, or at least I did until this whole coronavirus fallout stuff. (laughs) <laughs> yeah you're yeah, connected with cool, man. you know these guys up here don't you i know a little bit about them i don't know uh pete and all the guys that well i've talked to nicole a couple times and yeah um I, i've been to maine several times maine's beautiful um but uh you know i'm i'm once all this stuff settles i'd like to continue to try to pursue a relationship with them but uh uh in the meantime it kind of got put on the hold yeah i mean it's been it's been rough um in fact i reached out to pete the other day and i'm like hey man because we're, we're friends like we see each other every couple of days i'm like hey i need to get training like me and one other guy want to train what can we go in in, in just like one, one to two days a week mm-hmm. and then get after he's like uh let me think on that one so it's still kind of up in yeah. the air a little bit but yeah i'll get you i'll it's get you mess. synced up when things when things settle down or change a little bit i'll get you synced up with the guys yeah cool man absolutely yeah. So you've been, I mean, you've been in the game for a while. How long you've been training jujitsu specifically? Jujitsu specifically. So I started training jujitsu back in 2003. So I wrestled for about three years in high school, you know, enjoyed it. And then, um, I wanted to fight and I wanted to continue grappling because I just, I enjoyed that environment for whatever reason, that environment was something that I didn't want to, to lose because whenever I was, um, training i was happy as a kid like i was doing great and then whenever wrestling season was over i was kind of pretty much in a funk and slightly depressed and so when i got back to when i got into jiu-jitsu i got a lot of that same vibe from the gyms that i was training at and so i got i got hooked right from the beginning back in 2003 so i started in may of 2003 so this month it'll be uh, 17 years yeah man you've been going for a while it's uh how's the body holding up that's what i'm always curious about (laughs) uh man you know it's honestly right now knock on wood the body's better than it has been even when i was in my late 20s because so like when i was younger you know again we're all young we're we're dumb you know so we can recover and you know when when I was younger, the only way that we trained back then was just basically you go hard every time you beat the crap out of your body um rest days are for pussies that kind of stuff right right and then as you get older, you're kind of like, well, maybe there's a more intelligent way to do this. And um, I started doing some sort of studying into the way that like, like high level athletes train, not jujitsu guys, but like, like other sports where they're paid millions of dollars. And they're like, they have people that are like bean counter types that tweak every little nuanced thing. How do they train? They don't train hard every day, right? They undulate their training up and down. And so Um, you know, in my early thirties, I started to kind of incorporate that into it where, um, I wouldn't train as hard on some days, some days I would train hard, add a little bit more drilling in specific strength training, things like that, basically giving everything its purpose and not really basically not being a complete masochist and just beating my body up and thinking that's good, but really trying to be purposeful with what I was doing. And, uh, you know, I've been actually more successful in competitions and my body's actually holding up really well. And I, I honestly don't feel like like when I was like, in my, when I was around 29, I was getting to the point where I'd wake up out of bed and I'd be like crawling up the stairs. And I'm thinking like, I'm 29 years old. Is this, is this what awaits me into my, my thirties and forties? And then now, man, like f- from doing all the different stuff that I do, I feel great. You know, I don't have any problems whatsoever. Yeah, that's good. Cause that's, that's something that's been on my mind. Cause I'm, I'm not very long on the path. I've, I've been training for uh, about a year, a little over a year consistently. Mm. Uh, and I have some, I think pretty normal things. Like I've never really had to deal with any sort of like medical problems or any injuries or anything like that. I have some, you know, nagging joint pain in the fingers and you know, the shoulder flares up occasionally, but pretty mild stuff. I just want to make sure it's something that I can continue to do. And I don't want to, I don't want to beat myself up just for the sake of beating myself up. Like I want there to be purpose to it. And mm-hmm. I want my, to, to train myself, to improve myself physically and have an objective, a, a meaning and a purpose behind it, not just to get your ass kicked every time you go in. 
Yeah, you know, I think most of the time in those senses, I mean, accidents happen and injuries happen. There's no way yeah. to avoid that. I mean, we're yeah. our bodies are a decaying structure, right? Slowly, slowly, every so often, it just it withers away to the point where when we get really old, the stuff's just going to break down, right? Um, but I think in a lot of cases, we we're our own biggest worst enemies when it comes to injuries and things like that. Because you know, I don't know what it is about a lot of us, but men tend to almost be masochistic with their bodies, right? I was talking about that earlier. When I was a young man, it was just like, throw it on me. I'll do any crazy workout. I'll beat the hell out of my body because I associate that sort of that pain with, you know, improving and no pain, no gain, that kind of stuff, right? That's how it was brought up, right? What most of us were around our age. And then, um, you know, a lot of times as you get older, there's a disconnect because, you know, as our mental facilities, typically we get, we get wiser, we get smarter, we have more experience as we get older, right? But our bodies are going the other way. The body's getting weaker. It's getting uh, more prone to injury. It takes longer to recover. And so you have to like sort of keep yourself in check because it's really easy to like, you know, start to feel fatigue or feel your body aching or whatever. And then just say, screw it. I'm going to go train anyway, or I'm going to go really go after this weight. Or maybe you're doing squats and you feel a pinch in your knee. And instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to let this rest for the day. No, I'm screw it. I got three more sets. I'm going to pound them out. And then you end up having a worse injury. And so a lot of times I think that we're, we're by far our worst enemies where if we listen to our bodies and sort of just kind of take a step back, a lot of times that'll do a pretty good job as far as keeping you a little bit injury free and, you know, giving yourself some rest time, things like that. Yeah. And you can still, you can still train. I mean, you may not be able to do jujitsu or like live rolling sessions, but like you can go light, you can practice on technique. Like there's things mm -hmm. that you can do if you're dealing with a nagging injury. Like, like for me, I actually, so I'm 39 right now. Uh, and like, I feel stronger than I ever have in my entire life. Like I'm probably the healthiest, the strongest I've ever been. But to mm -hmm. your point, yeah, things just tend to recover slowly, or I feel something <laughs> a little bit more, you know, than I, than I typically would in the past. And so I, I definitely think there's like a level of piss and vinegar that we had when we were younger. Like we had something yeah. to prove. And as I get older and it's probably just maturity and some, some level of wisdom, uh, it's, it's. It's just, I, I don't feel like I have to like, God, like bang everything out. I want to get strong. I want to be physical, but I'm going to do it in a way that sustains my ability to train and to be strong and then ultimately to serve my family and the people that I care about. Because you can't do that yeah, if absolutely. you're injured. You can't do that if you're hurt. Like no. you're less effective if you're banging yourself up to the point where you're injured. Right. And if you get some good training partners, like the, the guys that I train with, you know, w there's times where, you know, we'll have injuries or little things like that. And, you know, we can all move around still like we can still, uh, you know, it's not quite a flow roll. It's not like we're just not doing anything, but we're still moving and getting a sweat in, but you're just not ripping anything. You know, I've had guys come back from their surgeries and stuff. And as they ease back into it, you know, we make sure they train with the, the more experienced guys and, you know, you take them easy, take it easy on them so that they can kind of you know, nurse them back to strength. And then once they're back to strength then you go hard again. So yeah. um, I, I think that if you don't have the ability, it's just like weight training, right? If you go into the gym every single day and you try to do a one rep max um, on your, on your big lifts, like your squats or deadlifts or something, you're going to get injured eventually. Like you're just, it's too much like wear and tear on the body at, at heavy intensity. So instead, what do you do with weight training? You maybe sometimes you might be a deload week and then sometimes you're hitting 70%, 75%, maybe 85, maybe you, you touch that max or you go to a competition and you really push it and then you come back down to a certain percentage. You have to be able to do that with your training as well. You've got to be able to like go into it some days where, okay, today's going to be a really hard day. And then tomorrow and the next day after that are going to be a little bit on the lighter side to allow me to train, stay active. But at the same time, we're going to kind of recover and we're going to keep the training light. So we get that blood flow, but we're not getting that same level of uh, damage to the body from the hard, hard rolling. And so you got to be able to kind of move it back and forth. And when you look at like a high level athletes, they do things like that. They, you know, you football players are not just basically putting the pads and helmets on and smashing each other in the face every <laughs> right. practice. Right? right. Like, I mean, they're it, it just too much wear and tear in the body. So you've got to do other things around that and be able to change the training up. Yeah, that makes sense. I do like that. You're talking about this intent and in training and you probably learned that with, with <clears throat> a level of, of, of technique and just being in the game long enough. Cause when I go and I haven't even considered this, so it's a really good point for me is I just go and I show up I'm like, okay, I'm just going to yeah. do what, what the instructor says and I'm just going to roll and it's just going to go the way it goes. But now that I'm thinking about it, as you're talking about, like, I don't do that in other facets of life. Like I don't just show mm -hmm. up to my day and I'm like, yeah, whatever happens, happens. <laughs> I don't go into the gym right. 
and, and say, yeah, you know, maybe like I'll try some deadlifts and like maybe, I don't know, some push press. Like I have a plan for everything <laughs> that I do, right? But yeah, yeah. I don't think I've ever really right. developed that same concept with training jujitsu. So that actually makes a lot of sense to me. That's, that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think it's one of the allures of jujitsu, right? Because you go in and you have a coach, so you get to turn your brain off a little bit. So mm -hmm. if you're a guy that, you know, spends their time really working, the, you know, doing something where it involves, especially creative work where your brain's really working, right? And by the end of the day, man, you just want to turn the damn thing off a little bit. And so that's an allure of jujitsu, but you know, if you have a good coach, they should structure their training accordingly so that people are getting different sort of levels of intensity with their training, right? That's a good thing. Um, but at the same time, on a personal level, you can even just take personal responsibility and say, okay, listen, my body's a little bit banged up today. So I'm going to like roll two rounds and then take two rounds out or take a round out or something. And, you know, again, if someone calls you, oh, you're being a, a wimp or whatever, <laughs> again, it, it it's maybe, you know, if, if there are situations where maybe that's could be true, I guess. But I think for a lot of times when you're talking about jujitsu and training, like, especially for most of us, 99% of the people in jujitsu are not high level competitors. They're just people that want to do it as a hobby. Take your breaks. You're, we're looking for long-term consistency, not short-term intensity, right? So right. you look at people all the time and people understand this. I'm not a high level competitor. I'm just a hobbyist. I'm just a guy that works out or whatever. But then when it comes to take a break, the person will say, well, man, get out here and get your, your, your next round in. And maybe there's a time to do that to push mental toughness. Um, but I think that a lot of times, sometimes it's good to take that break. So that this way you allow your body to recover. And again, you know, just like, um, when you think of say thing, things like sprints, right? You don't want to do sprint with a very short rest and then more sprints because your sprint ability is going to go way down. You'd rather say sprint, give yourself a little bit of time to rest, sprint again. If you're doing a really heavy training session, like say you're doing a heavy set of squats, what do you do? You take like two, three minutes between so you can give your nervous system time to recover. So there's nothing wrong with taking a rest to allow yourself to get more out of that next role or that next training session. And I think that's something where most people, and I, and I guess this is especially is true with the guys that, again, with our age, right? No pain, no gain, just that's the way you do it, right? We, uh, we never really appreciated the sort of the other side to train, the recovery side and the sleep side, the, the dieting side, all the stuff that makes that hard training possible. You know, like the old bodybuilders back in the day, I used to hang out with when I started lifting, they would say, you don't grow in the, the gym, you grow in the, the bedroom, in the kitchen, you know, mm. you grow based upon your eating habits, your sleeping habits, your rest time. The, the stimulus is the, the lifting, the recovery, that's the growth. And so it's no different than jujitsu when you're basically wiring like motor patterns into your body. If you're not getting sleep, if you're not recovering, if you're not eating properly, those, those motor patterns are not going to be absorbed as quickly as they could be. And your body's not going to be able to as efficiently execute them because your body's going to be in, you know, uh, bad shape. Right. Yeah. I think where people get into trouble and, and I've been in, the, we've all been in this boat is where we tell ourselves, oh, I'm taking a rest day, but the rest days <laughs> compound, right? Like, no, you're taking like a rest month at this point. This is no longer a rest yeah. day. So I, I think mm -hmm. you have to be as objective as you can in evaluating, okay, am I doing this genuinely to rest or am I doing it to cop out from, from actually pushing hard and training as hard as I can to improve? Right. Yeah. And I think that goes back to like what you're talking about, having some sort of plan. So like, you know, talking to yourself and saying, okay, listen, um, you know, last week when I did back to back training sessions, I felt like trash the next day. So maybe I'm going to train, I'm going to train Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, I'm going to do a, like a, you know, maybe Tuesday, I'm going to rest Thursday, I'm going to lift and Saturday, I'm going to lift or something, whatever, but making some sort of plan for the days that you plan to train and plan days you don't plan to train, you know, maybe, you, maybe you, you know, ice or uh, sort of, prioritize family night on one night or something, but, you know, mixing it up, but having some sort of plan and, and coming up with some sort of routine. I think the routine is really important because once you sort of get into a rhythm with something and it becomes a routine and a habit, you really don't have to think about it. You know, like I've, I've been asked so many times because I've been, I have been training grappling for a long time. People say, well, you know, um, did you ever have trouble going to the gym? Did you ever think about quitting? I mean, for me, quitting was never really an option. I enjoyed it too much. And as far as the, the not going, it literally became so ingrained. Like it, it, it's even strange now because with this quarantine, I've been going to the gym on a nightly basis and morning basis for like 10 years as a coach. Mm -hmm. And it's weird because like my body still has this urge. It's like, Hey, we should be doing something at six o'clock at night. We should be on the mats or whatever, you know, we shouldn't be here at home. Um, but, uh, 
yeah, I think that when you, when you set those routines, you don't have to think about it anymore. It becomes like brushing your teeth. You know, if you don't brush your teeth, you're like, Ooh, my teeth feel dirty. You know, something's right. wrong. Or, you know, if you don't wash your hands after using the bathroom, Ooh, I feel dirty. Something's wrong. <laughs> so it's the same thing. Like it's, you know, when you do something so much, eventually you don't have to think about it. It's just a hardwired routine. Yeah. I mean, most people don't need to convince themselves that they should put like deodorant on or go brush their teeth or take a <laughs> right. shower. Like it's just, it's just part of who you are and what you do. I, I guess my question is, is there a point at which you're just training too little? Like if you're, cause I've, I, I've thought about this and I've had other people ask me, like, I, I don't know why they ask me. I'm not the expert obviously when it comes to this, but they'll say like, I can only go once a week. And I'm like, is that even worth it? Like, I guess it's better than doing nothing, but is that going to really you, mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? Like, what's the point? Like, do you, should you train like three days a week minimum or is it like, no, one day's good. I guess it depends mm -hmm. on what you're trying to accomplish, what you want. Yeah. Your goals, you know what I mean? And that's another thing. Like people, a lot of times we, in, especially in jujitsu, the sport aspect of it is, is very captivating, right? It's fun to watch. Like, you know, it's fun to see people do crazy things. It's like you, even the, even the average casual gym bro who lifts some weights knows the, some of these strongman guys because it's captivating. It's fun to see people do the extreme, right? It, it just is but most of us do not live on those extremes. And so I think that a lot of times people have to dial back because you'll get people that'll come into jujitsu that are not competitors. They don't ever want to be a competitor, but then they're watching like a highlight video of some 20 year old black belt who's training his face into the, the ground. And they're like, okay, I want to do that. I'm like, no, you don't, you don't want to do that. Like that's a <laughs> that's At a least not now. <laughs> Yeah, that's a 20 year old man's game. That's not our game, right? We've got right. to do a little bit differently. And I think that again, you got to cut and go back to why are you doing this? You know, and I think that if someone, won't, if you can squeeze in a day a week, that's a hell of a lot better than nothing. I mean, for me right now, I mean, I don't know about you, but if someone said, hey, listen, you know, with quarantine laws, you can't train six days a week, but you can train on Monday. Mm -hmm. Would you go Monday? Hell yeah, yeah you'd go sure. Monday. You'd be like, hell yeah, I'm going to be there in a heartbeat. Like, I don't give a shit. I, I want to train. Right. So right. I think it's one of those things where, you know, especially with people with jobs and careers and families and juggling all that stuff, if they can squeeze in a day, get your day in. If you can do two, that's great. Um, but again, it's not to say that there's a magic number because I've done videos on this. Like, I, I've had some guys come in who they could only allocate two days a week. That's all they could do. Mm -hmm. And on those two days a week, man, they were focused. Like some of my younger guys, sometimes they get to the point where they come in like almost every day and you can see that some days they're on, some days they're off. Sometimes they're there and they're just like, I'm here because I'm supposed to be here more often. Right. Because they want to compete or something. Whereas these guys that have two days a week, because of the fact that they're juggling so much, they, they squeeze every ounce of whatever they can get out of that class. They're attentive. They're there. They're focused. It's not something that's, again, they're not taking it for granted. You know, they're taking it 100%. I'm here. I'm right. attentive. I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm so glad that I was able to make my, my Tuesday, Thursday schedule. And some of those dudes like are great. Like, I mean, some of them, I mean, they're not high level competitors or anything like that. Um, and they, they sometimes lack the ability to say, roll like for, you know, five, you know, or 10, 10 minute rounds or something, something crazy, right? Their, their cardio may not be there, but as far as their technical ability and their ability to roll like uh, really well in those early rounds is fine. They just might need a break here and there in between, but as far as their technical ability, it's fine. Yeah. Are there some things then, and this will apply specifically to now because a lot of people are quarantined. They can't go in, they can't train, even if they wanted to pick something up, it's like, you can't go do it. Are there things that you should be doing in, in your time off, your days off that are actually going to make a difference. Like I, I look at books, I've got a couple of books that I, that I go through and I look at technique and I watch your videos and I'm like, okay, well that's good. Mm -hmm. But none of it's reinforced with the, the muscle memory, like actually putting it into practice. So is that even helping me or is it just like inflating my belief that I can actually do something without actually really being able to execute that? Yeah. You know, it's, it's hard, you know, we're all so different, but I'll say it like this when the first time I ever had a really like sort of long layoff was maybe I had been trained for about a month. I had competed already and I had been training jujitsu for a month. And then, um, my buddy, my buddy was driving, me and him would go to the gym. I didn't have a car at the time. And so he ended up getting a new job. And so I couldn't get to the gym anymore because I didn't have a car. So I had to save up to get the car or whatever. So what I did in the meantime was, is I couldn't, I knew I was going to go back. Like I knew I had to do it. There was like, it was on my mind every single day. It was like, I'm thinking about getting back there. I'm saving up the money to get a car or whatever. Well, in the meantime, I lifted weights. I went running. I did everything I could in that sense. Um, this is the, this is a time before YouTube. So I was buying DVD, um, 
like instructionals, yes, but DVD matches because I wanted to watch matches and see how right. things work. Um, you know, because that seems to to me that like if I watch matches a lot, I seem to get a better understanding of what's going on. And then when my buddy his his shift changed, and you know, I was a young kid, but I told him I was like, look, man, I, like I, I didn't have a car at the time, but. I said, look, man, I'll pay your gym membership if you drive. Mm. So I was like, I'll pay your gym membership, you know, if you drive and then I'll just pay your, your membership. So, you know, for me, I, this is 2003. It was like the gym membership was like 80 bucks a month or something. And so I'm like paying 160 bucks a month, which is a lot of money for me at the yeah. time. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, so I was like, yeah, I, I'll, I'll take care of it, man. So we started training together. And when I came back, my body was stronger. I'd gained about 10 pounds over like what, six, five, six months or whatever. Um, you know, I, I got a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger. And from watching videos, and I mean, I'm talking about, I would watch because there, there wasn't a lot of content out there. I would watch these matches over and over and over again, right? And just, just wear these damn discs out. And by when I came back, I had a better understanding of what was going on than I did when I left. And my body was in a better was in better shape. I still had to get my mat win back. You know, it wasn't as you know sharp on the mat, but as far as like me being strong and physically ready to take on the training, I was in a better spot. And so for a lot of people that are, you know, on, in this quarantine time, I know that there's a lot of people that like working on dummies and stuff like that. And that's fine. If you like doing that, that's, that's cool. For me, it's just, it's not worth it, The juice isn't worth it the squeeze for me it's like if i get my body stronger lift some weights correct muscle imbalances stretch do all these different things that is going to be one strengthening my body which is that's a good thing right that's good for everything that i do in life but also when i come back to jujitsu if my body's health if my body's healthy then my body can more quickly absorb all these movements because jujitsu is just movement so if you've got a body that's rigid broken tight everywhere in pain you're not going to be able to move and do the jujitsu. But if you've got a body that's healthy, that's strong, that's ready to rock, jujitsu is not that hard to pick up. And I think for most people that have been, um, you know, training and, you know, maybe they're just experiencing a few months off, it's not going to be like this stuff leaves you. I mean, you, you think about like, again, high level athletes will take off. They have the off season. They won't even do their sport. They're just, they're doing other stuff. They're doing off season, right? They're, right, they're not working right. out and, and doing football football or whatever they got an off season so they don't lose everything when they come back in fact a lot of times they come back they for their body feels refreshed their minds refreshed they're excited to be back and for a lot of people i think the same thing would be good like look it's a it's a crappy situation that we're in um and hopefully again hopefully we don't we don't have to fight for our ability to do jiu-jitsu because again depending on where you're at um some people are saying like you know no social distancing until you know vaccinations are available yeah it's not gonna happen um, yeah, I, I agree, but hope we don't have to fight on that. But um, you know the, uh, but when we get back again, take this as like a chance to work on all these other things: your your diet, your your body, your strength training, your your stretching, and all these different things. Maybe these areas that you lack, and then when you come back be ready to rock and roll and be excited about being there because you've been waiting for it. And again, the other side of it is that along with the, the body stuff, I really think there's something to watching like people roll and watching matches because you get to see what jujitsu looks like. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, if you watch it over and over and over again, you get a sort of, a, uh, it, it just sinks in subconsciously. It's like if you read books, um, if you, like for instance, if you read a particular author and you read through like a whole series of books, you'll pick up that guy's cadence, like it, the way that he writes and stuff. You might might even find that all of a sudden it starts coming out in your own writing where you're like, Oh shit, I'm writing like that guy because I've been reading his books. Right. So when you watch people com compete, when you watch them roll, you may not be doing it yourself, but you'll see what's going on. And then when you come back to training, you'll start to recognize certain positions and things better because you just got done watching them for hours and hours and hours. Um, I think that technique videos are probably not as helpful, but I think that actually watching the actual act of rolling and seeing what goes on is, is useful. Yeah, I, that makes sense because I'm thinking about it like from the context of somebody who's never, for example, played football before. Like you take two guys who've never played football before and one of them mm -hmm. has been watching football religiously and the other isn't even familiar with the game at all. And you put them on a football right. field. Like, who has a better likelihood of being somewhat successful, right? Of course, the guy who at least knows the yeah. rules, knows the game. I know when I watch people roll and I see like tournaments or you know just some crazy stuff on Instagram, I'm like, it broadens my perspective to what is possible. Like I'm like, it, it, it opens, expands mm -hmm. my mind. I'm like, whoa, I didn't even realize that was a thing. Like I didn't even realize you could do that. Yeah. And I think that improves, improves my game. I, I do agree with the technique thing that you're talking about. Cause I remember this must've been two or three months ago now. 
uh, I had watched a video that you had done from, I, I want to say you're from, from side control, from side position, and you were doing a, a from Kimura to Amer or Kimura Americana, you were just going through the progression arm bar. And yeah. I actually watched that. I, I, if I remember correctly, the day before I went and or the, the day that I went training that night. And for me, it was good to see mm -hmm. that instruction. And then two hours later, go put it into practice. Cause I realized, Oh, okay, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. here's what he said. Here's what I'm going to try. Some of it worked. A lot of it didn't, but at least I had mm -hmm. that foundational, but then it was supported by me actually going and doing it and trying it. Yeah. I mean, that's super important, especially with the techniques and stuff. You have to be able to have that feedback. Right. Cause you know, for me, like I'm, I'm really like, this is the way that I digest like instructional information, whether it's business related or grappling related, whatever it is, I'll take that one, like that one thing that I'm trying trying to implement and whether it's a video, whether it's a book, whether it's a little passage or something, I'll reread it, like rewatch it, re-listen to it over and over and over again. And then meanwhile, I'll try to implement it. So this way you're going through this, this, this sort of iteration cycle where you're trying it, getting the feedback, then going back, looking at the information again, going back and trying it again, getting the feedback until you sort of sync up with it and you get a good feel for it, you know? And I think that that's the way the techniques work. And so I, I don't think that techniques are really useful in the sense right now, you know what I mean? And, and I think honestly, I was talking to one of my black belts, him and I are both in the same boat. Um, him and I are both like just nerdy jujitsu guys that like to watch techniques and study stuff and then try them out. And currently neither one of us has really the, um, the drive to do it because you're like, well, I can't use it. I don't get to try it on anyone. Right. So it's like, I got this cool like weapon. Window that shopping. I want. <laughs> Yeah, it's like I can't I can't use it. I can't I can't do anything with it. So I think that uh, and even my like my uh, YouTube statistics have shown that like the talking videos and all those do fine. But the technique videos, it just it's not interesting because you're like, well, I can't use it. Right. So uh, I think right. once 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 you're back to training, it, it might make more sense. The trap that I'm worried about falling into because <clears throat> I have I have uh, four kids and my oldest two, they're they're uh, 12 and nine. They like to roll. We have some mats in the front room and we just roll every couple of nights and we just nice. have a good time. And the things that I do to that, I got to be very careful of like lulling myself into believing that I'm better and more capable than I actually am. Because when I'm rolling with my 12 year old, there's things I could do that I could never do to a grown <laughs> man who's like pushing back just as hard as I'm pushing forward. So I got to be careful not to like lull mm -hmm. myself into believing that I'm better than I am. We, we as men have a tendency of doing that all the time. Like our egos are so high and we overestimate our abilities. And then we set ourselves up for failure because we think we'll perform well. But when the reality hits, it's like, oh, I'm not at all capable as I, I thought I was. Yeah. You, you know, it's weird. I had the, I kind of had the opposite with kids and everybody comes from a different level of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I naturally sort of default go to ultra intense and ultra competitive and everything that I do. Um, and with kids, it, when I started teaching kids, it was, it kind of did the opposite to me. So one of the problems that I had early on in training was I couldn't turn down the damn intensity meter to relax a little bit. Like if I rolled with you, I mean, it was a hundred percent. I'm going, it's world championship style roll. Right. I'm trying right. to win. That's all, all that matters is winning. And then I remember starting to roll with kids and like, you know, it's so playful because I'm like, I'm not worried about losing to this kid. I'm not worried about hurt. Yeah. You I don't want to kill or crush him. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and so, you know, you start playing with them in that sort of playful attitude in, in sort of, it gave me a different gear to shift into for my rolling. So sometimes when I train, sometimes I'm in a very playful mood and like I, I even with the music in the gym, I'll put music on that reflects that we'll listen to like some Bob Marley or something, something that's chill. Right. And I'll, I'm in a playful mood. So I'm like, I'm not there to like kill and go for the win or competition role. And then there's other times where I'll go back to that normal intensity and go hard. But um, it actually helped bring that in. Cause when I was a purple belt, that was a big problem for me because I couldn't try new things. And so when I started teaching some of the kids, then I started to bring over that attitude towards my regular rolling. And I found that it, it was able to, um, you know, again, this happens when you have a sort of a certain, certain level of skill to buffer you from, uh, people, but it allowed me then to just kind of have a little bit more playful sort of a mindset sometimes, uh, when I need to try new weapons and try new techniques and things like that and just be okay with screwing up a little bit, you know? Yeah. Um, but I could, I could see where, again, this happens sometimes with, um, 
with coaches where if they never get out of their gym or if they don't have anyone in their gym that can, can push them, mm -hmm. they can sometimes, and this is true about all martial arts, not just jujitsu. You know, you have these, these stories where the, the jujitsu or the, the martial arts coach is in the gym and they're like, you know, everybody looks at them like they're God or something, right? Because they're so good. Right. But, but meanwhile, and then if like another good person comes into the gym, they might not roll with them. You know, they might not train with them. You know, they'll say, well, you can roll with my students. You can train my students. Um, you know, I've seen that several times where where um, guys didn't really want to train with certain people because they didn't like the idea of maybe looking bad in front of their students. Yeah, and so yeah. um, that's a case where you can see that people getting lulled into, uh, you know, their own hype and thinking that they're super Buying cool. their own though. bullshit. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, I, I remember when my mindset changed a little bit more to what you're talking about, because I tend to be an intense guy. Like I think the objective of anything is to win, like to be the best. Right. If we're going to do this podcast, like this is going to be the best damn podcast that <laughs> yeah, yeah. two guys ever had before. Right. If we're going to be in the gym, like whatever, like I want to go hard, but I remember I was rolling with, um, and he, it was a younger, it was a younger guy and I was rolling with him and he was just getting started. And, and I'm not, like I said, I'm not very far down the track, but sure. I got him in a, in a, in a submission and I remember thinking, dude, I don't, I don't need to like hurt this guy. Like, I don't need to finish this submission. Like it's, it's evident that I have this in place and I let it go. And mm -hmm. then I just kept rolling. And that for me, that moment was like a switch from kill and destroy everything to let's just be curious. Let's have fun. Like that worked. Gotcha. I don't need to prove that I got you. I got you. Now let's move into something else. And that mindset of like, just have fun with it. Be loose, play, be curious. When somebody catches me, it's not like, damn, it's like, whoa, how did you do that? Like mm -hmm. That curiosity, those couple of mindset shifts has really been advantageous for me. Yeah. You know, there's a time to turn it up. You know, there's of a time course. to go really hard, but I mean, you, you even think about it this way. Like you can look at like stories, um, you, whether they're in like old, you know, mythological stories or even in popular culture and movies, um, of warriors, right? Warriors are, you know, you can think of that whatever you want to, but, um, you can think about the way the warriors typically trained, right? Typically there's some sort of story where, you know, the, the young kid comes in and there is both an awareness and a submission that goes on where the young warrior, the young fledgling martial artist, whatever, it was is made painstakingly aware that they have no clue what they're doing right mm -hmm. and then afterwards it's up to them to submit to the teaching of the coach and then it's after that submission that they then can learn right they, they become receptive to it and so like when you know we have a new guy come in we what i'll do typically because i found this weird thing where if i don't if i don't show them that they don't know what they're doing then what will end up happening is is they won't uh they'll walk away thinking and oh man, these guys suck. I, I beat the crap out of them, right? Uh, yeah. So what I'll do typically, and I, you know, I probably would have been that way when I first got into it. So what I do is, is I'll if they make some really bad mistakes, like turning their back or something, I'll I'll make sure they're aware of that. But otherwise, I'll very quickly like wrap them up into some positions, get a submission again, all with control so that they're not hurt or whatever, but to bring that awareness to them. So right. like, all right, I I can finish this anytime I want to, and then afterwards. That makes him, oh, wow, he's pretty good. And then we play. And then I'll just kind of mess around with them a little bit. We'll move unless they make some really gl glaring mistake, like turning their back or something. I don't, you know, I won't like go for the kill. I just try to get them used to moving and slowly work their way up until we can, you know, get them to the point, you know, where after a year or so, that's where they'll really start to be able to kind of like be able to turn the intensity up a little bit. You know, I, I think the threat or the potential threat of pain and suffering <laughs> is actually what makes it rewarding like if to me if mm -hmm. if you and i are rolling we're in, we're in a grappling session and there's no like threat there's no consequence to it it's almost mm -hmm. like what the hell is the point of this but i think yeah. the fact that you could put me in a position that would literally and physically hurt me is what actually allows me to improve and accelerate the process of learning because I don't want to be in that position. Right. Well, it's even like, it's just a game. So it's like, we're playing a game and you either win or you lose. And I know some people say you learn. Well, yeah, you learn, but you, of course you learn from your losses because it stings. It makes you take notice, right? So it for instance, hurt. if you're winning that it should hurt, it should make you kind of go, damn, I lost. Like, exactly. again, not to say, not in such a, not in a way that like keeps you up at night and you're, and you're irritable with your spouse or something, but enough that makes you say, okay, 
you had negative feedback. So that lets you know, this does not work. What right. you just did, like for instance, if, if someone's rolling with me um, and like, especially like a young wrestler comes in, if they turn their back, I'm going to jump on that back. So they make sure not to do that. So when they get beat, they're like, damn, I got beat every time they begin to associate even subconsciously. If I turn my back, I get choked. I lose. Don't turn your back. Yeah. Right. But anything where there's a game in, involved, where we have a win and a lo uh, losing situation, then that's always, that's fun. Like again, but if there's, if it's like a, you know, one of these things where they want to, <laughs> they want to take away, like everybody gets participation medals I, and stuff yep. and every, every, everybody wins. It's like, there's no point to it. Like the, the whole point is, is competition and that competition is fun. And it, it, I don't know what it is. It triggers something in our, in our like primitive brains where, you know, that's how co humans flourish was through competition and just the, what it is. Well, I, I think it's good specifically for men too, because one of the things that a lot of men talk about is like building a band of brothers, having other men in their circle who they can spend time with, learn, coach from, met, be mentored by, et cetera, et cetera. And what I like about jujitsu is it teaches you about other people. And the best way I can describe it is it lets you know in, in other men who's going to bitch out and who isn't, right? Because if somebody goes to a training session and they get they get wrapped up, they get submitted, they get banged up and they get pissed off and they never come back. That's somebody who's probably going to bitch out in other areas of their life. And like, I don't really want that guy in my circle. Like I might be mm -hmm. friendly with him. I might, I might support him to some degree, but like, I'm not going to rely on that individual to help me through any troubling times. If on the other hand, I see a guy come into jujitsu and he gets humbled and he gets banged up and beat up and he gets frustrated with it to the point where he actually improves himself. I'm like, okay, well, this is a guy who I'm actually interested in having in my corner because it's proving that he can take an ass kicking and learn from it, grow from it and get back in the fight. And that's what I want to see in people who are in my corner and in my circle. Yeah. You know, I think that, you know, anytime adversity happens, you get to really see who someone is, right? Like mm -hmm. it's a it's a peer into what, because we all have this, this superficial covering over top of us. Um, I was listening to a, a screenwriter talk about some of the symbolism in movies. And he was talking about that. Most of us go around our life, right? Um, he was talking about the movie Shrek. So Shrek puts on the first one. So he puts on the knight in armor. So he goes to save princess Fiona. The, the princess cannot see that he's an ogre under the, under the armor. Right. And then slowly he starts to lift his visor and give her a look in and see who this person is. And then slowly removes all the armor. And I think that that's the way a lot of us are, right? We walk around with our social masks on to cover up who we really are. And so when you start to get into adverse situations and situations that are challenging to you, it starts to chip away at that. And you get to see, well, who is this person? How do, like you said, like if you get smashed, how do you deal with getting smashed? Do you do okay with it? Do you pick back up? Um, you know, and, and again, that stuff translates on and off the mat. So again, who is this person? And you start to see even weird sides, like where I've had guys come in who are the most chill dudes. They're so low key. And then when you start training with them, they're the most intense individual. Their bodies are tight and rigid. And it's like, there's something going on in that person deeper than what you might think. Um, and then in vice versa, I've rolled with guys that are super hyper and whatever. And then as soon as you roll with them, they're super relaxed. They have mm -hmm. nothing to prove. They're just there. So you get to see these different sides of people that through rolling and through training that maybe don't show up in the day-to-day -day situation. And kind of going back to that band of brothers type thing, I think, uh, you know, it, it's super cool, you know, to be in an in, environment where you can be around a bunch of people and you know you start to connect you have this common thread amongst each other so we're all in here to make each other better and therefore we're bonded in that way meanwhile all the stuff that normally separates us our political affiliations what part of town we're from what's our what's our job the car that we drive all the, none of this shit matters mm -hmm. you know it's like i mean because like in the gym like we i will have political conversations with guys that are like complete opposite to me but it's completely like cordial and we're not we don't hate each other right. it's just like hey what do you think man like why do you because i respect the person and i deeply care about them and so therefore it's not an attack on their character it's a more of a curiosity why do you think that and so it's a cool thing that i think that a lot of times if people if more people were in things not necessarily just jujitsu but in more situations where they were exposed to a wider swath of people I think that it would be a great thing for the society at large just because you would get to meet people that are not part of your, you know, your local neighborhood or the people that are just like you. You're going to get to meet a lot of people that are different than you. And it's a really cool thing to do. Well, and I think you find out too, that most people have more in common than we typically think. Like we're mm -hmm. banded toward this common objective. Pretty much we want the same things out of life. The way we go about getting it or achieving it might be different for everybody else, for, for, for everybody. But 
I mean, ultimately, we're all pretty similar. You know, we all want the same things. I, I, I look at jujitsu in a way as like my personally for like me is like my therapy a mm-hmm. little bit. Yeah. You know, like I get to go work things out. I get to focus on one thing and not have to focus on all these distractions. I'm free of distractions. I don't really have when I'm in there. Uh, a whole lot of like responsibility looming over me. I don't mind carrying the burden, but sometimes I got to take it off mm-hmm. and, and take care of myself. So it's been a good, it's been a good therapy uh, session for me as I, as I learned to, to train and get involved and go down this path. Yeah. It's just really good for clearing the, uh, clearing the head, clear, you know, kind of getting a clean slate. Like I know that, you know, in some of the most difficult situations that I've ever been in my life, you know, rolling a lot of times where, you, where you're in the middle of that role and you can't think about everything. It's very meditative. Mm. Right. And then when you're done, you're like, okay, go back to it. Right. So for instance, a lot of times when you're doing a, a basic seated meditation, um, I, I do these and again, I have no problem with it, but I know that a lot of people, when they first start doing a seated meditation, they have so much trouble, like just not thinking. Right. Mm-hmm. And again, it's a practice sure. that you have to get into, but jujitsu right out of the gate, you don't get to think because someone's trying to choke you. So therefore <laughs> it gets you out of your head and it's really a cool thing for, so a lot of people are not used to doing that. And so when they get done training, they have this along with the, both the meditative aspect, you have the physical training aspect, which, you know, there's tons of science to back up the fact that our bodies are meant to move. They're not meant to be sedentary. So you're doing all these different aspects and hitting all these different like points. And when you're done with training, you're like, all right, whatever life plans to throw on me, I'm ready to take it, but I'm good now. You know, it's just kind of a, it just sort of dumps out the stress out of your body a bit. Yeah. No, I like the concept too of moving because that's something that few of us do enough. Like if you're anything like me, you sit behind a computer or a desk or in a chair Mm -hmm. and you're like hunched over and, and, and you're just not getting the movement that you need. That's been really good. I didn't think about it till you said it, where you said jujitsu is just movement. I mean, it really is like Mm -hmm. you're trying to move and trying to keep from somebody who's trying to move you and you're moving Mm -hmm. around that individual. Like that's actually a really interesting way to look at it is like, it's just, it's just movement. So there's some resistance there, but ultimately it's just movement. It's just moving. It, you know, even when you think about lifting, for instance, so like if you're doing a bench press, young lifters early on when they first start doing like a bench press, we'll say that just as an example, a big compound lift, the numbers that they can lift jump super quick in the beginning, jump dramatically. That's not necessarily because their muscles are getting so much larger or stronger, but more of a case where the body's recruiting all the muscles together that are necessary to do that exercise more efficiently. Mm. So that when you do something, the motor pattern is becoming much more efficient. So the body says, hey, we need this bicep muscle, this tricep muscle, this chest pectoral muscle, whatever, gathers them together more uh, efficiently and quickly. And then boom, you can lift more weight um, and it's much easier to keep good form it's no different than that with jujitsu. Basically the more repetitions you do, the more uh, times you attempt to move during rolling, all you're really doing is along with the feedback and sort of fine tuning things, you're basically just getting your body to do all these movements much more efficiently and uh, to, to recruit all the muscles necessary to execute that pattern. And that's, this is why in the beginning, the arm bar, for instance, from guard is like, you know, it's like six different steps right, and right. then uh, eventually it becomes one step. Like you can just arm bar. It's that's it. A hip escape, a, a basic shrimp down the mat, a shrimp down the mat can be t- taught in about three different movements where eventually becomes just shrimp. It becomes one thing because the body becomes efficient. Yeah. So fluid. Very much. And so basically just all motor pattern learning. Yeah. So, you know, I I don't know what you're, are are you training at all? Like, is your gym open? Like how how much are you training right now? (laughs) How much can you disclose? uh, I should ask that. How much can you disclose? I, there's a couple guys that I get together with that are, we're all basically, we're not out doing anything. We're basically, we go to the gym and that's about it. Like we go to the gym and we're, we're, we're quarantined at home. And so, um, you know, I don't, that's what we do. We we're, you know, we're all, we're, that's, that's, that's the group that I'm training with right now. So we, we get a couple times a weekend. Um, you know what I mean? And I've been lifting too. Um, you know, but other than that, that's that, you know, and again, it's, it's not just me. Like my students are beginning to, um, message me, you know what I mean? And like, like, dude, like, when do we get like, are, you know, are we, are we going to train? And even some of my guys are putting together rolling sessions at their houses and stuff. Cause basically when this thing happened, I rented out my business partner and I, we rented out our, uh, our gym to people. So we let them come up and pick up our barbells and weights and stuff. I kept some stuff uh, at the gym yeah. for me to use. And then, uh, you know, we had a bunch of extra mats. So we, we let them take mats home and put them in their garage so that them and their families and their friends could train. And so we just rented out the gym, you know what I mean? So we just yeah. like, here, you guys take it and go. Um, and so a lot of them are still training in some capacity because I mean, honestly, for me as a coach, that's the biggest thing. Like I don't, 
monetarily, like my business partner and I, we were both very frugal, you know, <laughs> we, we don't, we, we're not trying to live a ball and lifestyle. That's not our uh, version sure. of success. Yeah. But, um, we've been able, we, we have a nice little cushion that we can sit on for a bit, hopefully not too long. Right. Yeah, um, but right. with the, the gym, I, I, I miss the people, right. I miss being inside of the gym with people. That's the thing that really bugs me the most. It's just that I don't get to see those people that I deeply care about in that deep connection, uh, on a regular basis right now. It's just very strange. Yeah, it's tough. I, I kind of feel like, I mean, I wanted to have this conversation and maybe we'll have to do a follow-up because I, fi- I feel like a little bit like the timing's off because the guys are going to hear it and they're gonna be like, dude, I want to do jujitsu. <laughs> or or the guys yeah. who are already doing jujitsu are going to be like, oh, I really miss jujitsu because these guys started talking about it. But mm-hmm. as things start to ease up and, and society starts to get back to, to normal, like what is it that you suggest people that want to get involved and start walking down the path get into is it just simply finding a gym experimenting with some some places in your area like what is the best path to get on 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 the track well first off you'll have to lose the fear because you've been fed a bunch of fear for the last several months right yeah um yeah so you know, i'm a history geek so when i look at historically situations you look at depending on how long the fear lingers will depend on how fast everything kind of comes back to a normal state and the economy recovers and everything else. If everybody's walking around with fear of the virus, fear of the market, fear of the economy tanking, whatever, then it's going to be bad. But if people kind of say, okay, look, we we did our time. Let's, let's get back on the horse. So first thing is before you jump in the gym, lose the fear, right? Like, (laughs) cause otherwise you'll be worried about, I'm getting really close to someone. What if I get sick? Whatever. So anyway, um, rant it was over. funny. Yeah. I saw a gym I, that, uh, I was going to tell you, I saw a gym that said b- before everything like completely closed down, it, it said mm-hmm. something to the effect of like, uh, because of potential coronavirus where we've stopped, um, shaking hands. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> like you stopped shaking hands, <laughs> but, then, but then you're going to get on the mat for like five minutes with, and roll around in somebody else's sweat and blood. Like, yeah. uh, okay, I, I guess <laughs> like, it's just kind of funny when you see stuff like that. Oh, dude, I was I was driving up to the grocery and right next to the grocery store, there's like a Home Depot and there's like a line out the door with people with masks on and they don't even have their nose covered yes. or anything. And they're, yeah. they're, they're scratching in there. I'm like, who are we kidding, guys? Come on. You, know, you got like it's, 200 people at this Home Depot. It's like, it's a joke. Um, it's a show. But, uh, you know, yeah. yeah, absolutely. But anyway, um, as far as it goes with like getting into training, I mean, the best thing is to, I would encourage people, one is to do a little research on their gym you know, just to find the gyms that are in their area. And then most gyms offer a free class. So I encourage people to try those free classes, go, go get a feel of it. And you know, if you're looking for a gym for most people, what I would say is you want to find a gym where the tech, the technique and instruction and all that stuff is good, but you also want to find a place that you feel like you kind of belong because you could have the best technical instruction, but if you don't just, if you, if you don't vibe with the people, it's not going to work because you're joining a tribe, you're joining a group of people. um, You're joining a group of men and women. And if you don't, if you don't, gel with those people, they can have the best technique, but it's just not going to work out. Whereas if you find a group of people where you're like, man, these people are cool, they're inviting, and this feels good to me, that's your place. And maybe that place is maybe 20 minutes more of a drive, but I guarantee you that's going to be a better sort of situation long term than going to the place that may, and I'm not saying this is always the case, but I just, I see this happen sometimes, um, opposed to going to the closer place, but you don't really enjoy the training as much. You know, you want to be in a place where you feel like you belong and where you feel like the people are you know, of the same sort of, you know, cut from the same sort of cloth that you are, at least on some level, not necessarily your political beliefs or anything like that, but just as a person, who you are, the, the actual substance of your, yourself as a person, not the, not the BS that we try to separate ourselves with. Yeah. I mean, the culture, it seems like every place has its own culture and you've got to jive with that. And, and on the other side of it, I think you have to be careful of using your discomfort of, of putting yourself in a new environment with new people as an excuse mm. not to go there. Cause I think some people would do that too. Like, Oh, I just didn't jive. I'm like, well, you were also the new guy and you went yeah. once. So like, you don't really know if you jive or not. Yeah. You know, I think that for me, like, you know, I remember when I went to my first training session, I was nervous as can be. I was so nervous. I had to bring my other two buddies with me. One, because I didn't have a car, but two, because <laughs> I, I wasn't going to go by myself. I was just yeah. too nervous about it. And, and I was the guy who had wrestled and everything else. And then after that first class, I had a blast. Like I was, right. I was like, this was so much fun. And you know, honestly, that's my goal when new people come into the gym and, and that's the goal of the instructors that help me is that when someone new comes in, our job is to make sure they have a good experience and they walk away like, dude, that was so much fun. I maybe came in with some reservations. I came in, I was nervous, whatever. But after the class, this was cool. And again, if you walk out of there feeling like something's wrong, 
then again, maybe it is on you and you got to do some soul searching. But again, if you're normally a person who is open-minded, if you come out and with a feeling of like something's off or you feel bad about something, then again, try another gym and see if that's the situation there. If you go to all the gyms in your area and everything's bad, then there's probably, it's probably on you. Yeah, um, right. But again, one of those gyms will probably gel with you and you'll probably enjoy it and, and have a good uh, situation from it. Right on, man. Well, hey, I want to ask you a couple of other, uh, other questions before we close things down. The first one, cool. what does it mean to be a man? Uh, you, you know, th this question, it's interesting. Um, I've been asked this before and I've thought about it before and it's different for everyone. I think that, you know, everyone has to come up with their own definition based upon who they are because um, either it's, it's very ephemeral abstract things, but um, I, my archetype of a man is based upon the strong men that were in my life as a young man. Like um, my grandfather was the, the one of the older men that I was closest to. He was the person that taught me how to, you know, throw a, a baseball and took me to get swim lessons and we would go out in the country and, um, you know, go fishing and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, he had a scar from his neck down to his stomach. He served three tours in Vietnam. He'd been mm. blown up and had shrapnel in him. He was a man that sacrificed for his family. He was a man that fought for stuff, even if it wasn't the most popular thing. Again, it wasn't a good war, but he was over there and he did what he had to do to protect his, uh, the, he was a platoon sergeant. So he protect the guys that were in his platoon. Um, you know, and he, uh, he sacrificed a lot for the family and, and did everything he could for the people around him. He was a, she was a strong man. And for, in that sense for me, because I felt like he was a guy that did what it took and did the things that weren't always fun or whatever. And he took care of things. Um, my uncle was another sort of archetype in that sense where he, he was a builder, man. He would, he would, he again, took care of his family. He went to work and took care of business. Um, you know, he would put things into his own hands and he would take care of business. Like if he had to build something, he'd build it himself. You know what I mean? He had that mindset. And so again, um, all these different men in my life would, would sort of drop these things. But I think that it's, it's worth for everyone to sort of take a little step back and, and, and assess to themselves. What does it mean to be a man for you personally? Because I don't think that there's a end all definition. I think it's one of those things where there can be lots of different things and it all depends on us uh, as, as people and what we believe um, is what I think. But uh, for me, there's a lot of different things, but they, uh, again, they, I, when I look at them, they come from the archetypes of the men that were most impactful to me. And one of the big things is, is again, with men, we, we have to sacrifice, we have to take care of our families. We have to, uh, we have to build things. We have to do things in, in, again, women can do these things too, just fine, but we have to take care of things in that sense. And I think that, uh, you know, that's one of the big things because, you know, when you think about men in, in, in like old tribes, right? old tribal societies would always have to take men out and they would have to teach them what it meant to be a man. So it wasn't something that they become a man. Women would, would have their typically after their first, uh, you know, period or whatever, there would be a party. Like she's becoming a woman. She now has the ability to give life. And with the men, it was always like, look, you guys are weak. You're not ready to be a man. So we've got to show you what it means to be a man. And it means that you got to take care of business. You can't run away from your responsibilities. You have to take care of your family. You have to do all these different things and don't run away from the things. And I think that's one thing that really lacks in our societies are we have a lot of men that are week. They don't, they don't stick around with their wives. They don't stick around with their kids. They don't stick around with their families. They run at the side of something that's uncomfortable, you know? And I think that, um, that's one of the things to me, that's not a good thing. So anyway, I'm starting to rattle off, but it's a, it's a working definition for everyone, I believe. Yeah. Well, I, I like that you're talking about sacrifice and responsibility. And I also like that you're talking about looking to other men who have gone before you that you admire and respect and look up to. And that to some degree, you try to emulate those qualities. I think that's a very powerful lesson there. Mm. All right, brother. Well, how do we connect with you and learn more about what you're up to? So yeah, man. So if, um, if anybody's interested in what I'm doing, so if jujitsu, it's probably going to be jujitsu, right? So <laughs> if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you can check out my, you, you can literally put jujitsu into the internet and just put it in there. Um, if you want to check out my YouTube, it's on YouTube jujitsu. Um, I send out some emails Monday through Friday. If you want to get on those and get some information, you can go to jujitsu.net. That's my main website. Uh, you can sign up. I'll give you a free little, uh, book on jujitsu. And then from there, you'll get some messages from me. Uh, but again, if you're just interested in seeing what I'm up to, just put in jujitsu wherever you're at on the internet and you'll probably find me somewhere right on we'll sync it all up i appreciate you i imagine at some point in the not too distant future hopefully we'll get together we'll get some training in that'd be really cool yeah, be a good time. uh and i gotta tell you i appreciate everything that you are doing because i've learned a lot from you and uh it's helped my game and so i really appreciate you taking some time today brother thanks a lot hey thanks ryan nice to meet you brother all right man we'll stay in touch